Hey guys, and welcome back to my series of Left Behind videos, and now we come to the one that was, without a doubt, my favorite when I was a kid, but again, like the other movies, I haven't seen them in a while, so let's see how they hold up. Left Behind 2 Tribulation Force. Now, Left Behind 2 Tribulation Force came out in 2002 and was a very highly anticipated sequel to the smash hit that was the first Left Behind movie. And here, everybody's back. We have all the same actors. We've got Buck Williams. We got Rayford Steele. We got Chloe Steele. We got Nikolai Carpathia. And here we pick up our movie really quick after the last movie. It's only been one week later. Usually with movies like this, they do like a month, a couple months, six months, a year later. So that way we can see a little bit of development of the characters in between movies and you can kind of imagine the gaps ourselves. But no, this movie picks up right after the last movie. I don't really know if that was the correct choice because on the one hand, you only have seven years of the tribulation. That's not a lot of time for a lot of stuff to start happening. So it makes sense for things to move a bit quicker now that all the Christians have been raptured out of the world. But on the other hand, I do think narratively it would flow better if there was a little bit more of a gap in between the first and second movie and that's mainly because of our characters now all of our main characters had great arcs in the first movie everybody here went from not believing to being a fully committed christ follower over the course of that movie and here we pick up and that's exactly where they are and because of that the arcs in this movie are either non-existent or very minimal because a lot of the heavy lifting narratively has already been done and I think if you gave it a little bit more of a gap and maybe had a little bit of struggles happen in between the movies you can play around with how these characters are feeling living in the end times but because this is right after the last movie it's only been a week they're still very fresh in their faith they haven't really come across a lot of obstacles and in this movie some of them do face obstacles but I don't think it's handled nearly as well as they did it in the first movie so what is going on in this movie well the world's did deteriorating, there's martial law, there's shooting in the streets, and a lot of looting and rioting, and there's just kind of lawlessness everywhere. And it's very early on in the movie when you see Nikolai Carpathia, the Antichrist, take full control of the world and the UN. And the first big move he makes is to consolidate all of the world currencies into one unified world currency. And if you're at all familiar with the scriptures, this is all referring to the Mark of the Beast. And the Mark of the Beast, you know, the 666, has kind of become a pop culture trope and there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding it but the bible specifically says that this mark will be tied in some way to currency you will not be able to buy or sell goods without using this mark so a lot of people have speculated is it like a barcode is it like a chip whatever there's a million different possibilities for what it could be and it seems like this movie is taking the approach that this one world currency will be the mark of the beast and that's how everybody on planet earth will buy and sell using the same system and that could be a fascinating movie in and of itself but this movie kind of just breezes right by doesn't really address that and i would love to see an end times movie that fully develops that concept and makes that the central conflict of the film that's the thing that our heroes need to stop but even though that is concerning our main characters are more concerned with what's going on in israel at the wailing wall because there were these burn victims that were reported and the UN just shut that whole place down. And again, if you're familiar with scripture, you know that this is referring to the two witnesses that are said to preach the gospel, but then will end up dying for their cause. And nobody knows who these witnesses are for sure, but a lot of people speculate it may be a reincarnated Moses and Elijah that are here from the Old Testament here to preach the gospel. And it also says that they will have the power to protect themselves by calling down fire from heaven. So yeah, that would explain the burning. And Buck Williams, the ace reporter that he is, is like, I gotta go down there, I gotta investigate that because if there's a possibility that these witnesses could lead millions of people to Christ in these last days, I'm gonna take that chance, I'm gonna go down. And that's why Buck Williams is my favorite character because he just has that gung-ho attitude doesn't care about the risk even if it means cozying up to the antichrist himself to get permission to go down to the wailing wall and honestly the relationship between buck williams and nikolai carpathia is probably the most interesting part of this whole movie heck even this whole franchise because nikolai is so fascinated with buck williams and it's always left a little vague as to whether or not he knows he's a christian or he just thinks though so. he's on our team just like everybody else but buck williams is playing the double agent he's getting close to nikolai so that he can expose nikolai and ruin his plans and so in that way there's always this tension whenever the two are in the same room and they're talking and 
you don't know how much one knows about the other, and you're just waiting for Buck to slip up and expose himself in front of Nikolai. And Ray isn't left out of this plot either, because his plan is to become Nikolai's personal pilot. You know, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer kind of deal, so that way he can spy on Nikolai, he can report his findings, and that way they can stay one step ahead of Nikolai, they'll know what he's planning, they know how to fight him seems like a pretty good plan. And this is where the arcs, if you could call it that, really come into play. Because all these plans do stir up a little bit of conflict among the group, because Chloe, who's starting to be interested in Buck Williams, they're starting to date and flirt and, you know, they're developing a relationship. And she's not too happy that Buck is working with Antichrist, because that's incredibly dangerous. If he's exposed, he will be probably executed on the spot. And Chloe is understandably upset about that, and that causes some tension. And I guess the writers felt... Like, that wasn't enough to sustain a sense of tension or conflict throughout the whole movie. And they inserted this really dumb love triangle misunderstanding subplot. And I just hate these. I hate it when a simple conversation could resolve the main conflict in the movie. This is the case for, at least in this movie, Chloe and Buck's troubles. Because Buck's assistant is staying at his house for the time being for her own safety while they're investigating the story. And Chloe bumps into her, sees that she's got an engagement ring on, and jumps to the conclusion that Ivy, the assistant, is Buck Williams' fiance, and then just doesn't want to listen to Buck throughout a good stretch of this movie, and it's just stupid and tedious, and I hate it. But thankfully, it doesn't go on too long because they do end up having that conversation and resolving it, and everything's good to go. But what really bothers me about this whole stupid misunderstanding thing is that it takes away and distracts from the actual issue, the actual source of tension, and that is that Buck is going to be working with Nikolai, and I feel like that is something that should be unpacked a little bit. It should be discussed. It should be debated more than it was in this movie. I think it's kind of brushed aside a little bit because both Buck and Ray are going to be in some sense working with or working for Nikolai, and that is not for the faint of heart. That is a big task and you gotta put on some serious armor of god if you're gonna withstand that but like i said in the intro this was my favorite left behind movie when i was a kid and i know it seems like i'm bagging on this movie a lot and watching it again i don't think it is my favorite anymore i do think i have to say the first movie is better from a writing and plot standpoint this one's plot is a little thin but what this movie has is a bit more spectacle because the budget is a little bit higher and they can do a little bit more and they take advantage of that with the witnesses and when they get to the wailing wall and they see the witnesses and you see them breathe fire it is pretty cool and when i was a kid that just excited my little boy brain i was like okay left behind two that's the one where moses burns a dude to death by breathing fire on him. And watching it again, that scene is still pretty cool. And it's really this last 20 minutes of the movie is what I remember the most fondly about this Left Behind movie. And it's when they get to the Wailing Wall and Buck has this plan that he's going to bring the religious authority, this Rabbi Ben Judah, who's about to make this big speech on the Temple Mount declaring Nikolai Carpathia as the Son of God, as the Messiah, and that's exactly what happens. He brings them before the witnesses, they start speaking, and he starts listening, and he sees the truth. He knows that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and he rewrites his script at the end when he's giving it on the Temple Mount to Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And you can understand how frustrated and angry that makes Nikolai, because Nikolai wasn't in person when he gave that speech, he was actually on an airplane. And as soon as Ben Judah name drops Jesus Christ instead of Nikolai Carpathia, he loses his mind. And he starts cursing God on the plane, and just having a total fit. And what I love about it is, one, I just get that little sense of giddy pride whenever I see the Antichrist or an Antichrist character get just so frustrated that they start lashing out. But also, it does make you realize that, yeah, there is some serious evil power just boiling under the surface, ready to get out. And this speech was probably the catalyst for the very intentional and severe persecution of Christians in the end times, because the Antichrist just can't have a bunch of Christians running around, so it's time to start decapitating. Well, I would love to see that developed and even shown in a Left Behind movie. Unfortunately, the movie just kind of ends with Nikolai cursing out God, and that's about it. And watching this ending again, I realized I didn't really pay that close attention when I was watching it as a kid, because I always assumed that this speech on the Temple Mount was supposed to be the abomination of desolations, you know, when the Antichrist declares himself God and the false prophet, which I guess Rabbi Ben Judah was kind of gonna be, or at least he was being set up to be. And because I always felt like it was a little anticlimactic, because the speech didn't go the way Nikolai wanted it to, and because of that we still didn't technically get 
the abomination of desolation, so that's still in the very near future. So just looking at it from a biblical timeline perspective, not a lot actually develops in this movie. Watch again, I did realize that things actually do develop. Sure, we don't get the abomination of desolation, but what we get is the moment when thousands, maybe millions of people in the end times turn to Christ because of Rabbi Ben Judah's speech. And that is a whole different side of end times prophecy. It says that the witnesses will come down, that they'll preach to millions. And they did start preaching on live TV when Buck Williams was videoing it, but then Nikolai cut the feed. So they're like, okay, so how are they gonna preach to millions if they cut the feed? Well, Rabbi Ben Judah heard the whole thing and then he regurgitates it on live TV. The feed doesn't get cut. And I can only assume that many, many people come to faith in Christ through that. So in kind of a roundabout way, we still got there. Maybe not in the way people expect when they read it in Revelation, but it's still a very plausible way that that could go down. And I do appreciate this movie for not just giving us straight up Revelation talking points, that it does have a little bit of creativity and fun with it, that you think it's going one way, but then it's actually going another way that is also fairly biblical. I think that works fine. And before I wrap up, there is one other little plot point that I haven't talked about yet, and that is about the character of Chris. Now, Chris is a new character just introduced in this movie, and he's a friend of Ray's, and he starts going to church because Ray invites him, and he, at first, is not very receptive to it because he lost his whole family in the rapture, and he's dealing with a lot of issues, some alcoholism, some suicidal ideation, and there's actually a really good scene in his apartment where he's doing a little bit of the Russian roulette with his revolver, and he's gonna kill himself and he's like right give me a reason not to and they talk and they talk for a while and it's again very real natural dialogue it doesn't sound preachy it doesn't sound like something from pure flick and while you could say it is a little bit cheesy i think it's played remarkably straight and chris's conversion and the multiple steps it takes to get him to convert is probably the most realistic thing about any of these movies. And I definitely wanted to highlight that because I do think that is a high point in this movie. With the character of Chris, it does show that people are converting, that people are listening. They're waking up to the new reality. But that's about it for Tribulation Force. Rewatching it, I can definitely see why I loved it as a kid and as a teenager because it has a bit more action. It has higher stakes than the first one did because we are in the end times. We already know where the Antichrist is. We already know what needs to happen. And you can look out for these different signs going forward but watching it again the execution of it is a little lackluster i do think that they had maybe too many ideas and a lot of them are kind of half-baked like i said the whole one world currency thing just kind of goes by you don't even see it and they have this whole relationship drama with chloe and buck and that just doesn't feel fully fleshed out but there's also ideas that i think are done very well like the witnesses like the abomination of desolation bait and switch and especially with the character of chris i think his character was handled phenomenally. But now I turn it over to you guys. What do you think about Left Behind 2 Tribulation Force? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby. This is my nerdy talk and I'll see you in the next video.